face toward you and give me peace. The Lord bless you and keep you, make his face shine upon you, be gracious to you. Lord, turn his face toward you.
Wasn't that just a powerful song of worship? And uh, we're going to get ready to take communion. And if you've maybe just tuned in in the last few minutes, I want to encourage you to just do something uh, so that you can partake in communion as well. It's just go and grab, if you have some juice or some bread, go and grab that. If you don't have any juice, just grab some water or a cup of tea or whatever it is that you have in the cupboard right now. It's just symbolism. And as you get ready to do that, I want to take a minute and just talk about the significance of communion. And I want to read from Isaiah chapter 53. It's a prophecy that Isaiah gave long ago concerning Jesus, the suffering servant, and the death that he would face so that you and I can be free from our sin. This is what it says. It says, To whom, uh, who has believed our message? To whom has the Lord revealed his powerful arm? My servant grew up in the Lord's presence like a tender green shoot like a root in dry ground. There was nothing beautiful or majestic about his appearance, nothing to attract us to him. He was despised and rejected, a man of sorrows acquainted with deepest grief. We turned our backs on him and looked the other way. He was despised and we did not care. Yet it was our weaknesses that he carried. It was our sorrows that weighed him down. And we thought his troubles were a punishment from God a punishment for his own sins, but he was pierced for our rebellion and crushed for our sin. He was beaten so that we could be whole. He was whipped so that we could be healed. All of us like sheep have strayed away. We have left God's path to follow our own. Yet the Lord laid on him the sins of us all. I want you to think about the power of that scripture for a moment. Jesus, the sacrificial lamb, God's one and only son that he chose to give for you and I. He was beaten, he was whipped, he was crushed, he was spat upon, he was despised, he was rejected. All of that so that you and I could receive freedom because Jesus was the sacrificial lamb so that we didn't have to try and offer sacrifices on behalf of our own sins, so that we didn't have to pay the penalty of our own sin, but so that we could receive the ultimate sacrifice, the body of Jesus and the blood of Christ, broken for you and I, shed, so that we can be free from our sin. He gave everything so that we didn't have to give anything. And if we can receive that today, the Bible says that we will become children of the living God, our sins forgiven, wiped clean, not because of our righteousness, but because of the blood of Jesus. And so as we take this juice and this wafer, or whatever it is that you have in your hands, I want you to just think for a moment of the power in it, of the great price that Jesus paid. And as we eat it, let's remember Him the body that was broken 
for you and I. Let's just take a moment and eat it together. Now we think of the juice representing Jesus' blood. His blood shed so that our sins can be washed clean, forever clean. When we get to heaven, when we stand before God, for those who receive Him, we will be declared not guilty, all because of what Jesus did. And so we do this in remembrance of Him. Let's drink. Before we go into our next worship song, I want to take a moment and just pray over needs. And maybe you have a need and I want to just be able to lift that to God. So wherever you're at watching this online today, I want you to just take a moment. And if you have a need, let's just lift it up to God. Remember, Jesus paid a great price so that we can be freed, so that we can lift our prayers up to Him because He listens and He answers. Father, we just come to you today and we thank you that we can lift you up. We thank you for every request and every need that we can lift it up to you. Thank you that you see every need, that you know every person. And we pray for healing. We pray for wholeness. We pray for strength. We pray for breakthrough. Thank you that we can worship and serve a God who paid it all in Jesus' mighty name. Amen and amen. Come on, let's continue to worship our God. When the darkness falls, it won't prevail Cause the God I serve knows only how to triumph My God will never fail My God will never fail yeah, I'm gonna see you victory I'm going to see a victory For the battle belongs to you, Lord Yeah, I'm going to see a victory I'm going to see a victory For the battle belongs to you, Lord There's power in the mighty name of Jesus Every war he wages, he will win. No, I'm not backing down from any giant. Cause I know how this story is. Yeah, I know how this story is. And I'm gonna see a victory. I'm gonna see a victory. Belongs to you, Lord. 
Father, we thank you that we can come to you in worship. Thank you for powerful worship. Thank you that we can be in your presence and worship you. And Jesus, we thank you for all that you've done, for the fact that you gave us everything and our worship is what we can give back to you. And so we bless you in Jesus' mighty name. Amen and amen. Hey, church, wasn't worship just so powerful today? And as we continue in worship, I want to just talk to you about generosity for a moment because I know that in a time like this, it can be so easy to want to shrink back from generosity. But I believe that this is a time more than ever where we need to, as a church, become generous. And I want to just mention a couple of things that we've been doing over the last few days in terms of helping our community and meeting the needs of people. One of the things many of you know that we're involved in the community of the Santa Crawl, and we realize that there are huge needs there. And so just this week alone, we've managed to feed 200 families. Not only that, but we've partnered with a number of other churches in our area that are also partnering to work in the community of Santa Crawl. And together we have fed over 500 families in the community of Santa Crawl. We've also helped the Belleville Night Shelter in terms of taking care of the people there. We've also done a number of other things. One of the things we've done is that we've helped some people out with data. You might say, why would you help people with data? Because I believe in a time like this, it's so vitally important to be connected and some people cannot afford to be connected. And so we've assisted people in these ways. We've also assisted people who cannot get to the shops and who are struggling themselves. And we've helped them out with uh, various items of grocery. And we've even been able to, to make sure that they have food delivered to their door. And so these are just some of the ways that we can be generous. Why is this so important? Because Proverbs chapter 11 verse 24 says this, the world of the generous gets larger and larger, but the world of the stingy gets smaller and smaller. I don't know about you, but as a church and as an individual, I want my world to get larger. He goes on to say this, the one who blesses others is abundantly blessed and those who help others are helped. The benefit of generosity is that God will always take care of you. And so I want to say thank you for your generosity as a church. And I want to encourage you to keep giving faithfully, even in this time. Don't allow your world to get smaller, but keep enlarging your world. There's different ways that you can give. Online giving is the best way, and you can hop onto our website. And of course, there is a SnapScan barcode on the screen as well. And so you can participate in either of those ways. Let's just take a moment and pray. Father, thank you that we will not shrink back, that we will not allow our worlds to get smaller, but that we will keep allowing our world to get larger by being generous as people. Thank you that we can sow into your kingdom. Thank you that we can see the church move forward, your kingdom move forward. Thank you that we can help our community in Jesus' mighty name, amen. Church, we have fun and easy to use Kids Church content that is updated weekly for you to enjoy as a family. We would love to support you in prayer during this time. If you are in need of prayer or if you would like to share testimony of something you are thankful for, feel free to WhatsApp us on the number at the bottom of the screen. To watch previous Sunday services and other content, hop onto our YouTube channel.
Easter is coming next weekend and we are so excited to be able to offer online services on Good Friday and on Easter Sunday. What a great opportunity to invite friends and family to join in. We will see you next weekend for Easter services. Welcome to Urban Edge everybody. So good to have you with us online today. And if you've maybe just tuned in and this is your first time, I want to extend a huge welcome to you today as well. And I do pray that as we take the next 25 minutes and just share God's word, that it will really bless you and encourage your heart as God begins to speak to us. The title of my message today is, You're Not Alone. And we're going to read from Luke chapter 8, verse 22, and then we're going to pick it up from verse 26 again. This is what it says. It said, One day Jesus said to his disciples, Let us go over to the other side of the lake. So they got into a boat and they set out. Now just pause there for a moment. This is really important and this is why I wanted to pick it up from you because the Bible clearly states that Jesus had an intention to get to the other side of the lake. And of course, many of us know the story that unfolds from here. The disciples take him out into the lake. It's uh, during the nighttime and a huge storm comes up and the wind and the waves are beating on the boat and the disciples begin to freak out. And so they don't know what to do. Jesus is asleep on the boat And so eventually they wake him up and they ask Jesus for his help. And of course, Jesus calms the wind and the waves and everything goes back to normal. But then they continue to set out on their journey, which Jesus originally intended to get to the other side of the lake. And so we're going to pick it up from verse 26. It says, they sailed to the region of Gerasenes, which is across the lake from Galilee. When Jesus stepped ashore, he was met by a demon possessed man from the town. For a long time, this man had not worn clothes or lived in a house, but had lived in the tombs. When Jesus, and when he saw Jesus, he cried out and fell at his feet, shouting at the top of his voice, What do you want with me, Jesus, son of the most high God? I beg you, don't torture me. For Jesus had commanded the impure spirit to come out of the man. Many times it had seized him, and though he was chained hand and foot and kept under God, He had broken his chains and had been driven by the demon into solitary places. Jesus asked him, what is your name? Legion, he replied, because many demons had gone into him. And they begged Jesus repeatedly not to order them to go into the abyss. A large herd of pigs was feeding there on the hillside. The demons begged Jesus to let them go into the pigs and he gave them permission. When the demons came out of the man, They went into the pigs and the herd rushed down the steep bank into the lake and was drowned. When those tending the pigs saw what had happened, they ran off and reported this in the town and countryside. And the people went to see what had happened. When they came to Jesus, they found the man from whom the demons had gone out, sitting at Jesus' feet, dressed and in his right mind. And they were afraid. Those who had seen him told the people how the demon-possessed man had been cured. Let's just take a moment and pray. Father, we thank you today that as we come to you, that we can look to your word. Your word is a source of encouragement. It speaks deep into our spirits. So God, I pray that we'll open your hearts towards your word today. And Holy Spirit, we invite you just to come and speak to us, minister deep into our hearts and encourage our souls in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Amen. I don't know about you, but um, uh, as we began to get ready for this 21 days of lockdown here in South Africa, and I know all over the world, uh, many people are in the same lockdown situations, uh, but it was the Thursday, the day before lockdown, and uh, we had just spent some time with the family. We had gone out for our last drive, and uh, we were doing our last little bit of shopping, and it got towards evening time, and as it as it hit the evening time, and I began to realize that this is it. In a couple of hours' time, we were going to go into 21 days of lockdown. And even though I was not totally alone, I had my family here uh, with me, I realized that there were many faces that I was not going to see, regular people, regular faces that I was not going to see for another 21 days. And I've got to be honest with you, I began to feel a little bit of anxiety because of this fear of being alone. I suppose it doesn't help that I'm an extreme extrovert. So I just love to have people around me all the time. And so, and so this little bit of anxiety began to creep in this, this thought of being alone for 21 days. And you know, the fear of being alone can be extremely debilitating. In fact, Harvard 
uh, did a study and they tabled and they discovered or, or they tabled that loneliness is actually an epidemic. They've labeled it an epidemic. Loneliness in terms of interpersonal relationships. But there's another kind of loneliness that I want to talk to you about today that I think grips many people's hearts. And often we don't realize it when we're in the midst of it, but it can be so dangerous for our lives that we need to make sure that we overcome it in the right way. And it's the fear or the feeling of being alone in our situations. I don't know about you, but I've discovered that many people face difficult situations in life. And, and I'm sure that all of us have faced some hard situations. Maybe right now you're facing debt or you could be facing worry or, or anxiety, or maybe you have an addiction in your life, or maybe you've got a, a failed business or a failing business, or maybe there's some marriage problems. And so easily one can think to, to, to oneself, well, I've just got to face this situation alone. And you know, I believe that the enemy would want you to believe that for your life. He wants you to believe that the only way to do this is to navigate your situation on your own. But I want you to know today that you're not alone. That whatever it is that you're facing and whatever it is that you're going through in your life and whatever season you're in, no matter how alone you feel, I want to encourage you today, you're not alone alone. As we look at this text, we notice that there was a man who was in di a dire situation. The Bible says that he was demon possessed. In fact, uh, uh, in fact, the correct uh, tr translation of that was that he was demonized. In other words, he was in a place of torment and spiritual affliction in his life. We don't really know what it is that he had been through to get to this point or what it is that he had faced in his life. And the, the story only kind of uh, uh, gives us an idea of what he was currently going through. And so he's in a place of severe affliction and torment. And the result of this was that, was that the Bible says that he was living in the tombs. The tombs were the graveyards of those days. And so he was living in a grave site. And the Bible says that, that he was chained. People had chained him up. He was living in bondage. And he was literally losing his mind. He had lost his mind completely. But I think the most tragic thing about the story was not just the severe affliction that he was going through, but that he was going through it alone. That he felt as though he was alone and that he had to go through this thing alone. And I think it's one thing to go through a tough situation, but it's a whole different thing to go through a tough situation alone. But what he didn't know and what he didn't realize was that actually he was not alone because a miracle was waiting on the other side of the lake. He wasn't looked over. And that's why we picked up the story with Jesus being on the other side of the lake. The Bible says uh, that Jesus was actually ministering to the crowds of people. And, you know, so often when you're with crowds, it's so easy to get lost in the crowds. But Jesus didn't just get himself lost in the crowds. He paid attention to the individuals. And somehow the father had prompted Jesus that there was somebody that was needing his attention. And so Jesus says to his disciples, I want you to take me to the other side of the lake because Jesus knew that he, that he was getting ready to minister to somebody and set them free. And so they go to the other side of the lake. And when they get to the other side of the lake, immediately Jesus is confronted by this man. And Jesus instantly begins to set him free. And as we, as we see this man begin to find his freedom, we see the gratefulness and the gratitude in his life. And I don't know about you, but maybe it feels like you're alone in your circumstances and, and that you're having to face the situations in your life alone. But I want to encourage you today, you're not alone. Even when Jesus feels far, he's paying attention to your need. He's paying attention to your situation and he's getting ready to intervene if you will allow him to and if you reach out towards him. And so I want to encourage you today, you're not alone because the Lord is with you in your situations, in your trials, in your circumstances in your failures, a rescuer is getting ready to come. If you will just call out to him and look to him, you can, be, you can know today that you're not alone. 
And so I want to give you three things today that if you, uh, if you know that the Lord is with you, three things that I believe will encourage you. Number one, if I know that the Lord is with me in my situation today, then I know that number one, my mind can be at peace. My mind can be at peace. Notice what it says after Jesus delivers this man. It says, when they came to Jesus, they found the man from whom the demons had gone out, sitting at the feet of Jesus, dressed and in his right mind. I love that phrase, dressed and in his right mind. Uh, we all know that phrase, I'm going out of my mind. You know, maybe some of you have used it. Maybe some of you are parents today and you, you've been locked down for, for the last few days with your children and, and, and it feels like, like a few days is already a million years and you could have found yourself repeating that phrase, hopefully not aloud, but just in your own mind, like, I'm going out of my mind. This man was literally going insane because of the circumstances that he was finding himself in. And you might be feeling like you're facing a situation that's so tough that you're losing your mind. But I want to encourage you today, Jesus can bring you peace. Jesus can put your mind at peace. In Philippians chapter 4, verse 6, it says this, Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, every situation, by prayer and petition and with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. Now listen to what it says in verse 7. So it says, Pray and petition, Present your request to God. Then the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ. You know what Paul's saying here? Paul's saying that when you come to God, when you take your anxiety to God, when you bring all of these things to God and, and you lay it before the feet of God, when you take the situation that you're in and you lay it before the peace of, uh, before the feet of God, that the peace of God will come into your life. And the peace, it says, the peace that transcends all understanding. In other words, it's a supernatural peace. It's a peace that you can't get through trying to find some form of karma or go through some kind of meditation or, 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 or maybe you've got to go for a run to clear your mind. No, there's a supernatural peace that God is getting ready to give you because when we go through crisis in our lives, it's so easy to lose our minds. It's so easy to find us, our minds in a space where we're all over the show. But I believe that God can give you a supernatural peace in your life. I remember uh, when we were getting ready to, uh, or when we were starting to build uh, the one of our campuses at Pinehurst, and I remember the anxiety that I was going through. I wasn't, I wasn't completely trusting in God. I, I, I like to say that we were, but there was a part of me that was anxious, and the reason why we're anxious is because is because we we doubt, and and there was a small part of me I may not have confessed it and. Declared it, but there was a little part of me that was what was doubting, like, God, are you going to come through? God, are the finances going to come through? God, God are you, are, are you going to come through on the situation or, or are we going to find ourselves in trouble? And I remember as I was going through that situation that I had to just come to the place where I laid down at the feet of Jesus. And I remember one day just saying to myself, saying to, speaking to God and saying, God, this is enough. I, I, I hand it over to you. I prayed a number of times, but, but on that particular day, I just cried out to God and I said, God, I can't do this anymore. I can't do it in my own strength. I want to lay it at your feet. And in an instant, just in a moment, God gave me complete peace. Now, let me tell you this. The situation never changed, but my peace did. And that's what I want to encourage you with today is that Maybe your situation is dire, but it doesn't mean that God's peace can't enter your heart because it's the peace of God that transcends your situation. And some of us, we need peace in the middle of dark circumstances in our lives. And Jesus is getting ready to give you that peace. In Matthew chapter 6, verse 25, Jesus says this. He says, therefore, I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink or about your body or what you will wear. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothes? Why would Jesus tell us not to worry if he didn't know that there was a solution? Jesus knew that the solution was found in him. And so Jesus could confidently say, hey, you don't need to worry. Why don't you need to worry? I'll tell you why. Because Jesus is in control of the situations of your life. And so Jesus encouraged us not to worry. I remember uh, an old hymn that 
we used to sing. In fact, we've, we've revived it into, uh, into a modern day song. It's, it's called, It Is Well With My Soul. And th- these are the words. It says, when peace like a river attendeth my way, when sorrow, when sorrows like sea billows roll, whatever my lot, thou hast taught me to say, it is well with my soul. You know, the writer had a revelation that in the midst of the storm and the chaos, that supernatural peace could enter his heart. And I want to encourage you that whatever you're going through and whatever you're facing today, that your mind can be at peace. Number two, if I know that the Lord is with me in my situation, then I know that my chains can be broken. It's amazing. The story tells us that actually the chains that this man was in was not chains that he Um, that he put on himself, but it was chains that the people in his community had put him in because they had worried, they had feared for him that he was going to maybe hurt himself or maybe hurt some people in the community. But every time they put chains on him, the Bible says that he broke them. But even though he broke them, he was still bound because this guy's chains was not physical chains. It was spiritual chains. And what I've discovered so often in our lives is that when we're going through dark times and when we're going through hard moments, that sometimes the solutions that people offer us are not real solutions. In fact, so often those kinds of solutions can keep us in in other kinds of chains. They can keep us bound because this man didn't need just physical healing. He needed a spiritual breakthrough. The Bible says that he was tormented and often we're looking for physical solutions to spiritual problems in our lives. When Jesus came as the Messiah, the Jewish people were looking for a deliverer. They were looking, they were oppressed by the Romans. And so they were looking for a deliverer, somebody who could deliver them from their physical circumstances. But Jesus said that he didn't come to set them free just from their physical circumstances. He came to set them free from the spiritual bondage of sin in their lives. And so often as we face lives and we find ourselves bound and in chains, maybe maybe you have an addiction in your life that you're bound by. Maybe you're suffering from anxiety or some kind of worry or guilt, or maybe there's some shame in your life from things that you've done in the past, or you're living in bitterness and guilt. And you can face all of these things and they can be tormenting your life. And sometimes we want to look for physical solutions to a spiritual problem. But you see, Jesus is the only one that can truly free us from the chains that keep us in bondage in our lives. In John chapter 8, verse 36, Jesus wrote this and he said, if the Son sets you free, you will be free indeed. Jesus was making a very powerful statement when he said that. He said, God can break your chains. And when God breaks the chains in your life, the chains of addiction, the chains of worry, the chains of anxiety, the chains of guilt, the chains of shame, uh, the chains of chains of bitterness, the chains of, of unforgiveness. When God begins to break those chains in your life, then you will be truly set free. And some of us, I believe today, we need freedom in our lives, but we've been looking for it in all sorts of other places. We've been running off to to different kinds of people. We've been looking for all sorts of solutions. But the problem is that even though we've tried all of these solutions, they've just kept us in bondage. I want to encourage you today that if you find yourself in chains, Jesus is the one who sets people free. Jesus is the one that can restore your life, can break those chains once and for all in your life and truly begin to set you free. Number three, if I know that the Lord is with me in my situation, then I know that my future is secured. You know, we all worry about the future. And for most people, the stress of this situation, of this this lockdown and this whole virus situation is probably income. In fact, we know that um, uh, analysts are saying that the world's going to go into a recession. And I know that there are many people who've lost their jobs and lost their income. And there's many others who are looking at Uh, what's going on, and and they're worried about the income because we're worried about what's going to happen. We worry about our future. And you know, as we look at the uh, this man who was demon-possessed, the the Bible says uh, that he found himself in the tombs. Now, what are tombs? Tombs are graveyards. Graveyards are where dead people are found. 
And this really was symbolism that his future was dead. When he looked at his future, he, he saw no future. All he saw was death. There was, there was nothing in his future for him. There was just deadness. There was just death in his way. There, there seemed to be no way out. But you know, what I know about God is that God often does his best work when you and I find ourselves at dead ends. Think about it for a moment. The Bible is littered with God doing extraordinary things for people who found themselves at a dead end, who found themselves at a place where they were worried about their future, where they thought that their future was coming to an end. When the Israelites faced the Red Sea, they were at a dead end. But God miraculously opened up a way. When Jericho's walls were tightly shut up and the Israelites were wanting to enter the promised land, but the Bible says that the first city that they faced had huge walls and, and it was all completely shut up and they couldn't enter unless they went through the city. The Bible says that God is the one that collapsed the walls of Jericho so that the Israelites could enter. When, when Jesus was at a wedding and he performed his first miracle, the Bible says that uh, they had run out of wine. And so they were at a dead end. What were they going to do? The wedding was still going on and they had no more wine left. But we know that Jesus took some water and he turned it into wine. I want to say to you that God does his best works at dead ends in your life. And maybe your future feels like a dead end. You could be thinking to yourself, well, I've lost my job. Where's my future? You could be thinking I'm in a dire situation right now. I see no future. Maybe, maybe you got a demotion. Maybe, uh, maybe somebody, maybe an opportunity closes door on your life. Maybe something's happened in your life and it's felt like every single door is closed and you could feel like your future is at an end. I want to just encourage you and remind you today that God is the God of dead ends. That's when he does his greatest miracles. And if you're finding yourself at a dead end in your life, I want you to know that you're just bracing yourself for a miracle because your mess is God's miracle. Your dead end is an opportunity for God to do something extraordinary in your life. And I want to say that whatever mess you find yourself in, and even if you're feeling like it's a dead end in your life, that God's just getting ready to hop into a boat to get to the other side and do something great in your life. God is getting ready to unlock the dead ends in your life. And so I want to encourage you as we close today, you're not alone. Whatever you're facing, you're not alone because the Lord is with you. And maybe you feel like this demon-possessed man on the other side of the lake, wondering what good could come out of his life, wondering whether there was even a future in his life. But I want you to know that whenever you're feeling alone, that Jesus is getting ready to cross over into your life and do something great. If you'll just reach out, stretch out your hands towards him, God's getting ready to do something powerful in your life. Come on, can we just take a moment and pray? as we get ready to close the service. What do you feel alone in? What is the situation you're finding yourself in that you're feeling like you have to face on your own? Would you be brave enough today to just commit it to Jesus, invite Jesus in and allow him to come and be a part of the situation in your life so that you don't have to be alone because God's getting ready to take your dead end and turn it into a miracle. I want to take a moment and pray for you. If you feel like you're in that situation right now and you feel alone, maybe it's, maybe it's a relationship that you're caught up in. Maybe, maybe your marriage feels like it's falling apart. Maybe you've lost a job in your business. Maybe you, you're afflicted on the inside. You, you're full of worry or anxiety or bitterness or guilt or shame. And you're feeling like somehow you have to deal with all of these things alone on your own. God's getting ready to invade your life and walk you through this to the other side. I want to pray with you. Father, we just come to you today and we thank you that we never have to do life alone, that we get to walk this journey with you. And God, whatever situation we find ourselves in today, whatever mess we feel we're in, thank you that we're not in it alone. Thank you that you said in your word, you will never leave us. And you will never forsake us. So God, today we choose to turn to you in Jesus' mighty name. 
I want you just, wherever you are today in your lounge or wherever you find yourself and uh, wherever you're sitting today, just to keep your heads bowed for a moment. I want to give an opportunity because you might be here today and you don't actually have a relationship with the Savior. You, you don't have a relationship with Jesus, but today you're saying, Sean, I want to commit my life to Jesus. And if that's you today, I want you wherever you are just to pray this prayer with me in your heart. Say, Lord Jesus, I come to you today and I thank you that you are my rescuer, that you came for me, that you died on a cross for my sins so that I can be forgiven, set free and have a brand new start. And so today I commit my life to you. Thank you that right now I am born again. Thank you that the old is gone and the new has come in and that I get to have a brand new start and a relationship with you in Jesus' mighty name. Amen and amen.